time for Nerdgasm. Hey, what's up guys? Jerry here, AKA Barnacles, And today we're gonna be taking a look at Microsoft's first all-in-one desktop PC. They're calling it the Surface Studio, and it's got a pretty hefty price tag, so let's see if it's worth it. Also, we're gonna be taking a look at the Surface Dial, the peripheral that should come with this system at the ridiculous cost, but of course it doesn't, and it's $100 extra. But you're gonna need one. Now, the first thing I'd like to point out is the box art. You'll notice that it's very Apple-esque, and that it's got a lot of white going on in the background with a crisp picture of the product in the front. Now, you will notice there is one thing that's a little out of place on the front of this box. First off, I would like to thank Jen from Jacobson Communication for loaning me her very expensive Surface Studio to conduct this review because as you know, Microsoft would not send me one for review because I think they might hold hold a grudge. Just just a little just a little one. But we ain't gonna let that stop us. And on the back of the box, you can see it in its prone position, which is actually the, the primary feature of the Surface Studio, is that you can lay it semi-flat on the desktop so you can lay your arm on it and draw, because this is obviously targeted at graphics artists and content producers. Now, it does have a feature called Windows Hello, which is a special camera that's built in here that can look at your face and log you in. And apparently, it actually does it with a lot of security. You're not gonna just hold up a picture of a face and fool it. That's all there is to it. You just look at it and it logs you in. Now, I'll admit, I actually think that feature is pretty cool, but it does require the special camera and the infrared little doohickey bobber thing that's up here on the top. It also has a built-in five megapixel camera up at the top, and it's actually a very decent camera with pretty good quality. And it has stereo speakers built into the base that actually are Dolby certified, and they sound quite good. I didn't expect a lot of sound to come out of this thing, but it does sound very good. And there is a headphone jack on the back if you'd like to listen silently. Now, the first time I booted up the machine, I had to install a ton of Windows updates. And one of those updates is actually to support the Surface Dial. I couldn't get it to work otherwise. Now, the unit that we're testing today is the top spec device, the absolute creme de la creme best version of this that you can get weighing in at a whopping $4,200 US. And that doesn't even include the Surface Dial, which will set you back another 100 bones. Now they do make a min-spec version of this that you can get that has a core i5 processor, eight gigabytes of RAM, and an NVIDIA 865M chipset, which is in no way near fast enough to drive this crazy screen that we're gonna talk about in a little while. And you can have that discount model for the cheap price of $3,000. So we're talking big money here, guys. They're, they're not only trying to look like Apple, they're, they're trying to price out Apple also. Now, the first thing you'll notice when you look at the device is it actually is quite thin from the side profile. The screen is absolutely gorgeous and it all feels like it's made from a billet piece of cut aluminum. It's actually very, very similar to a 2011 MacBook Pro 17, which I used to have. I also couldn't help but notice that the styling on the computer itself down here at the base resembles not quite the same color, but just the structure and look of like the Apple products, like the Apple TV. I definitely get the feeling that they were inspired by Apple because guys, seriously, look at this keyboard. This keyboard here screams Apple keyboard. It's thin metal, the keys feel rubberized, even the tactile push of them feels identical to the Apple products. I can't help but think that whoever developed the Surface literally started with an iMac. Now the mouse that comes with it actually feels very, very cheap. I was a little disappointed in just how lightweight and plasticky it feels, I mean, it literally feels like a mouse that you'd spend maybe 20 bucks on at Best Buy. Also, the little scroll wheel is too narrow, and I didn't like that, and you can't scroll side to side. But I will give it this, the button click is very, very crisp. Now this system weighs in at 21 pounds. It's pretty heavy, but the nice thing about that is it keeps the base stable so that when you're moving the screen, up and down, it doesn't slide around a whole bunch and it feels stable if you whack it from the side. So it's not gonna just go cranking over on your desk. Now, the reason this thing costs so much is the screen. That is where all the money is on this bad boy. It is a 28 inch diagonal pixel sense display. Now, the cool thing about it is it has a three by two aspect ratio, not a four by three, not a 16 by nine like we're used to. It's a three by two. 
Now it's got a very strange resolution of 4,500 by 3,000, which isn't quite a 5K screen, but it is a greater pixel density than 4K. Now the panel supports 10-bit color right out of the box and it's sRGB calibrated as well as DCI, P3, and Vivid. And you can select those different color profiles right out of the side display. Now the screen supports a 10 point multi-touch. So you can use up to 10 touch points on the screen simultaneously. And if you're using the pen to draw on the screen, it supports 1,024 levels of pressure, which is probably more than anybody ever needs. Now the pen is actually really nice. It's all metal, it feels solid. It's even got a clip so you can put it onto your shirt, but it's got a magnet that runs down the side so you can put it right on the side of the screen on either side and it just magnetizes to it like a magnet on your fridge so you'll never lose the pen. It also has a button along the front here that you can use for changing the context menus and it's got an eraser that works as an eraser if you turn it around in your favorite drawing program or you can push it like a button and it'll actually bring up the Windows Ink workspace and it's all configurable about what macros work with what buttons so you can configure it to your liking. But I actually think it's pretty cool to open the Ink workspace just by pushing the button. I kind of want to play a detonator sound every time I do this. Now, the primary feature of this device, of course, is the zero gravity hinge that allows you to, with just one hand, push the screen down and have it flat with the desk. Now, you do have to move the keyboard and the mouse out of the way, but then once you slide it down, it sits pretty, pretty good angle here so you can get over the front of it for like drawing. And you can actually rest your arm and your elbow on the screen and it won't do anything. It won't, it won't mess up the detection at all. And I'll tell you what, this hinge is really well built. It's super easy, just with two fingers, I can grab the panel and pull it back up where it used to be, or I can just push it down. It, they did a really, really good job balancing it, and it feels like when you push on the screen with direct pressure, it doesn't move very easily. The only time it seems to move if you don't have it all the way down or all the way up is if you rest the weight of your arm on it, then it will push it down. Now make sure that you don't put your keyboard and mouse up on here when you're putting the screen down because I did that the first time and it about guillotined it and broke it in half. So don't do that. Now on the back of the base, you have four USB 3.0 ports. You have one mini display port. You have one RJ45 network port and you have one SD card slot. Now I wish they hadn't put the SD card slot on the back because it's very awkward to reach behind it and figure out how to put the damn memory card in. I really, for the life of me, don't understand why they didn't just put it on the front where it should be. It also uses a standard power plug. So if your cat chews through your power cord, you can plug in another one and you don't have to worry about getting something proprietary. And I'm actually really surprised that Microsoft did that because I almost half expected them with everything else going proprietary that that would be also. Now at $4,200, you would expect this machine to have blistering specifications, but you would actually be wrong. It has a sixth generation i7 processor in it, which is actually decent, but the seventh generation is literally right around the corner when this came out. Also, the graphics chipset in it is the NVIDIA 980M, not the desktop version, not the TI, the M, which is a substantially slower version of the 980, more, more geared towards laptops. And trust me, it is not enough to drive this screen. Now, I was really disappointed at that price point that it didn't at least have a 1080 graphics chipset and a real 1080, not an M, a real 1080. Because we're driving a screen that's over 4K resolution, and honestly, you need that graphics horsepower if you're gonna be doing anything crazy. Now, I was also disappointed with the storage in the system. The top spec version comes with two terabytes of storage, and they call it a hybrid drive but it's not really a hybrid drive. What they do is they have a 128 gigabyte SSD M2 drive that's installed into the unit and a 5400 RPM standard spinning disk two terabyte hard drive. And what it does is the controller inside of the system uses that 128 gigabyte SSD as cache for the larger drive. Now this makes the system seem like it's pretty fast booting up, but when you run benchmarks like Crystal Disk, the performance is beyond lackluster. And honestly, that really bummed me out because why are they using up so much space in the system for a large spinning disk hard drive when they could have easily put in a two terabyte SSD because they cost nothing nowadays. The price of SSDs has come down dramatically. Why the spinning disk, Microsoft? Now, one of the biggest disappointments for me is that the screen is fully integrated with the system. There is no external HDMI or display port going into the physical screen, which means you can't connect another computer to it. And later on down the road, when this computer down here becomes obsolete, which honestly isn't gonna be that far into the future, this thing needs to go to pasture, but I wanna keep the screen because there's so much money tied up in the screen that has incredible touch, guys. Incredible touch, incredible pen, pen action, and 
and a great resolution and vivid color. And it's very bright. And honestly, the black level on it is, is almost comparable to an OLED panel. It is that good. And it makes me sad to think that when this computer is obsolete, all I can do is throw that massively expensive screen in the garbage along with it. And further to the point, there is no Thunderbolt connector on this. And that makes me really upset because at least if it had Thunderbolt, I could connect an external GPU. I could get one of the external PCIe enclosures, put like, you know, a GeForce GTX Titan XP or a 1080 in it, plug it in through Thunderbolt and use that GPU externally. And that would greatly extend the life of this machine because the GPUs become obsolete far, far faster than the CPUs. But nope, Microsoft apparently wants you to dump a ton of cash on this, use it for a year or so, and then just throw it in the garbage and, and re-buy re the screen again. Now the system has 32 gigabytes of memory, which is actually pretty decent. But again, for the price, I would have expected 64 gigs. And since it is targeted at creators that are using stuff like Adobe Premiere, Photoshop, using 3D programs like Rhino and stuff like that, those are some memory hogging applications. So I'm actually surprised that they didn't double down on the memory. And the base version of this only has eight gigs. When was the last time you even saw a laptop that only had eight gigs? Now, after using the system for several hours, I will tell you, I did run into quite a few complaints. I noticed that the system has a lot of hiccups and stutters. When I was drawing in applications, I would have it just randomly kind of freeze up for a second, like a micro stutter, and then it would just continue again. And I also experienced that in a lot of the inbox applications, including the post-it notes and the inking, the inking sketch app. And also things will just stop working, like the eraser on the pen was just working a minute ago, and now the button is not bringing up the ink menu. Now, the one thing I noticed is when I use the Sketchpad application that's included with Windows 10 on this device, the pen actually flows very, very smooth with minimal lag, and, it, and the surface of the screen is so close to the tip of the pen, you literally feel like you're drawing on paper, which for me is a huge plus. I would say it's even better than the Wacom tablets. But, and this is a big but, when I moved over to Adobe Photoshop 2017, I found that there was a massive amount of lag on the pen when I was moving it around. It seems like Photoshop implements a lot more processing and the system just isn't up to the job. If you draw kind of slow and methodical, it's not a problem, but if you're scribbling really, really fast, you'll notice a significant delay. It's also nice because you can rest your hand on the screen or your entire arm and it doesn't affect anything. The, the, the point of the pen is where the drawing happens. But I do love the pen. It feels really, really natural drawing on this thing, honestly. It's probably the closest digital experience I've had to paper as far as how fast it reacts in this app. I just wish that it didn't have the problems with Photoshop. Also, I did have a couple of places where I was drawing very, very slowly, and I noticed that the line was a little bit jaggy, even though I was very careful to make one fluid motion. So there is a little bit of a wobble to it, and it happens in some apps, but not others. So I'm thinking that there's maybe some software in there that's filtering it and making the line smooth, and the software that doesn't have that picks up that jitter. Now here's the Haven benchmark, running at a whopping 10 frames per second at native resolution. And this further proves that the GPU just isn't fast enough to drive a panel like this. This is actually a pretty old benchmark that would run a 4K demo like no problem on most systems today. But this is already kind of struggling out of the box as you can clearly see here. So if you want to do any kind of gaming, I honestly wouldn't recommend this unless you're doing like some pretty old games or indie games that don't have crazy graphics. Now the irony is it supports Xbox One controller pairing internally. It has the wireless Xbox One dongle built into it so that you can pair your controller. But again, unless you're playing stuff at really low graphics quality, or lowering the resolution way down on the panel, which again, it's kind of weird aspect ratio. So you're gonna get some bars, um, unless you pick perfectly square resolutions that match to it, you're gonna have issues gaming on it. But again, I don't really think this is targeted at gamers, so I don't think that's too big of an issue. But the fact that it's $4,200 kind of tells me that it should, right out of the box, be bleeding edge hardware. Now, the sound is actually quite good on this system. It's a Dolby 2.0 system built into the base, and it actually has a lot of room filling volume. I was pretty surprised at how good it sounds and how the sound is kind of like coming from all around you. It doesn't sound like it's just coming from one pinpoint location. And also there is a headphone jack on the back of the unit if you want to listen to headphones and it actually sounds pretty good. It's got your pretty much standard run of the mill real tech audio chipset on board, but it's a decent amp. 
Now another huge pet peeve that I have with the system is that the resolution is so high for the 28 inch screen that you do pretty much have to use 200% DPI scaling. Now if you guys have used Windows for any period of time on a super high resolution 4K screen or better, you would know that DPI scaling sucks. It doesn't work with a lot of third party applications. And to be honest, it doesn't work that well with the first party inbox applications. And you'll notice all kinds of graphics glitches and above all, it bogs things down and seems to affect the frame rate and things on the desktop. I noticed that Photoshop, for instance, is a lot more responsive at 100% scaling versus 200% scaling. So 200% scaling is pretty much needed for you to be able to easily read everything on the screen when you're sitting close to it. Uh, so that bothers me a little bit. I would have preferred if they were gonna go with the low-end GPU for them to bring the resolution of the screen down a bit. I mean, honestly, I'm running 4K resolution on the 50-inch screens behind this, and even at 4K, 100% DPI scaling, all the text and everything is tiny and almost unreadable. Now, the other gimmick of the system, of course, is the surface dial. That's this guy right here, which is, for all intents and purposes, just that, a dial that rotates, and it's a button. Now the bottom of the dial has a rubberized surface so that when you put it on the screen, it kind of sticks a little bit, but you'll notice it'll just fall off unless you have the screen down at an angle. And even at an angle like this, you'll notice the knob still just slides down it. The only time that the knob really stays put on the screen is if you flatten it all the way down like this. So the way the dial works is actually really simple. You can either put it on your desk or put it on the screen and you just hold it down for a second and it brings up a menu on the screen and you can configure whatever functionality you want for the program that currently has focus. Well, since the desktop has focus, I can choose to make it a volume knob or a brightness control. So I'm going to say volume. I'm going to push that. And now when I rotate it, I can turn the speaker volume up and down. You can see in the corner of the screen, or I can hold it down again and I can make it a brightness control. And now I can change the brightness of my screen just by rotating the dial. Now the dial has haptic feedback in it. So as you're turning it, there's a little vibration similar to like your cell phone ringing. And it, and it kind of simulates a clicking sensation, if you will. So in some applications, it kind of gives the dial a, a fake click kind of thing. Yeah. But it actually feels pretty good. And the dial itself feels pretty solid. Now, if you put it on the screen and push it, it does the exact same thing as if you had it on the desk. It just brings up the menu wherever you put the puck. So that part I didn't really understand. I'm wondering if there's a way to program it so that it has different functionality on the desk versus on the screen. But just playing with the inbox applications, it seems like you just put it on the screen that does the same thing as when you put it on the desk. So I don't really understand. Like for instance, if I open up the ink, the sketch pad, right? So the sketch pad application, if I hold it down, I can select between volume, undo, pens, or size. So let me select size, right? So if I select size, now I can scroll through the sizes of the pen that I want to use, right? But if I put it on the screen, it does the same exact thing. That's a little wonky. It doesn't always work. It's definitely new technology. See, now it's bringing up the size of the pen, but when I rotate it, it's not working. So sometimes, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. All right, guys, let's just break it down for what it is, okay? You have a device here that costs $4,200 that already has a CPU that's about to become outdated. It has a GPU that is already outdated, that's a generation old, and it isn't even the flagship of the generation old GPUs. And it's the mobility version that you'd expect to see in a laptop. And it's driving an enormous screen with a lot of resolution. Now, because it doesn't have Thunderbolt, you're not gonna be able to upgrade it with an external GPU. And when you can't upgrade the unit, it goes in the garbage. It's also using a spinning disk hard drive, which is ancient technology. And I still don't know what the hell Microsoft was thinking going this direction. They should have just spent a little extra money and threw a real SSD in it instead of trying to use a 128 gig M2 drive as some kind of hybrid caching system. They didn't even try to use a real caching hard drive. They tried to do their own version of caching on board with the controller. And I'll be honest, I'm not impressed with it. After using the system, the number of hiccups and little pauses that I felt are, is stuff that doesn't happen on my main machine that has just SSDs in it. So I know that the spinning disk is to blame. I also was very disappointed that Adobe Photoshop, that the, the pen had so much more leg than the inbox sketching application. I would expect the pen to be equally useful everywhere across everything. And that simply just wasn't the case for me. Now you can get it to become a little more responsive by dropping the DPI scaling of the operating system down to 100, but having to go into settings, change the DPI scaling, try to get in the app, go back and turn it back on becomes a nightmare. 
Honestly, not a big fan of the keyboard. I was never a big fan of the Apple keyboards either. So I don't know why Microsoft went the direction of trying to emulate them instead of actually putting a proper keyboard on the system. I also don't like the fact that the mouse feels like something that you got at the dollar store. You guys will know what I'm talking about when you pick one up or you use it in the store. It simply does not feel like it's a quality piece. Now the Microsoft dial should come with the system because in every piece of advertisement that they do for this thing, they show the dial and they advertise that, oh man, this is the shiny fancy thing that really sets it off. And I always thought that there was something special where if the dial was on the screen, it somehow interacted with it in some special meaningful way. But at the end of the day, it's just a Bluetooth button. That's all it is. And it has a capacitive touch pad on the bottom so that when you touch it to the screen, it knows that that's where it is. I mean, that's literally all the magic right there, guys. And you're paying $100 for it. I do love the styling of the unit. I think it's nice, although there is significant fan noise when you have the GPU and CPU running at 100% during the benchmarks. There are three fans in the base, and they're not obnoxiously loud, but they are certainly noticeable if you're in a quiet room. But above all, the thing that makes this unit really fall short is the fact that the screen has no ability to connect to another computer. If they had just added a display port in a secondary mode, to the screen so that I could connect it to another PC, then I could continue to get life out of this awesome screen, this awesome camera, the hello feature, all of the stuff that's built into this beautiful color calibrated display, I could continue using on in the future, but they decided to block and lock all of that out so you'd be forced to throw it away and buy the next generation, which in all likelihood is probably gonna have the same display because this is a beautiful, proprietary display and I don't see them coming out with something that's hugely better than this in the next year, which is when they're gonna need to come out with a new product because like I said, the hardware is already becoming old right out of the box. Also, I think I forgot to mention that it does support Wi-Fi 802.11ac and is backwards compatible with everything else so you can wirelessly connect it to your network. And I will say that the fact that the screen folds down flush with the desk and it doubles as a very nice drawing surface is beautiful. If you are a graphics artist and all you do is sketch things and you don't mind the lag that I experienced in the Adobe products, then, then this is probably worth it for your business. It honestly is because it's a beautiful screen that you can jet, you know, you can lay over, you can put your arm on it. You can actually put a decent amount of weight into it because it's so well built. And, and, and it's amazing in that respect. But as a computer, I was woefully unimpressed. The performance just isn't there. Uh, the scrolling is nice. The touch screen on it, again, fantastic, even with your finger. I noticed no lag using my finger. And even on the Surface products of old, I noticed some lag moving your finger around really fast. And it's not here. So they did fix that. And the, the screen, God, the screen is just gorgeous. But I want to saw it off here at the bottom and throw this whole bottom chunk in the garbage and literally just plug this screen and all of its capabilities into my dual Xeon monster down here. So guys, that concludes my review of the Microsoft Surface Studio. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. I do think that it is a great first attempt for Microsoft. And I do think that it definitely has some unique features, but the screen is absolutely where all the money is. And Microsoft has done everything in their power to make sure that you have to throw that away sooner rather than later to buy the next generation of product. And I think that that was honestly the wrong move. They should have easily added a port to it so that you could use this display with something else because the base on it is so small and just feels like a weight for the screen that be, even though it's an all-in-one PC, I wouldn't mind just not using any of the electronics in the box and just using it as a weight to hold the screen while I connect it to a more powerful computer. And this would be much more useful to me. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you have any comments, leave them down below or come over and tweet me. I am at Barnacles over on the Twitter. Now I gotta box this beautiful machine back up after I flatten it so that I could deliver it back to Jen tomorrow so that she can start using it because she wants to do drawing and art. And I think that she is gonna be absolutely elated with the drawing capabilities of this. But as far as a desktop computer, I'm not having it.